Is your team not performing well? Is morale low and turnover high? Are you falling further behind the competition? I'm here to help. I'm your host, Shaney, and this is The Leadership Show, where business strategy and culture finally meet, and we make the long-awaited shift from rhetoric to results. I promise I'm not your typical boring leadership consultant, and I will help you get your shift together. Let's do this. Hello, leadershifters, and welcome to another episode of The Leadership Show with yours truly, Shady McGoskey. It is a pleasure today to tell you about today's guest. He is a well-known leadership consultant, author, and TEDx speaker, Ron Carucci. So, Ron, say a quick hello, and then I'm going to sing your praises. Hey, Shani. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> My pleasure. So, folks, Ron co-founded a consulting company called Navalent, and they do great work, and we're going to dig into some of their precepts and important conclusions from research studies they've led and so forth. He's also the author of nine books, yes, nine books, which includes the very soon to be released new book that's called To Be Honest, and I need to actually read my notes for the tagline, Lead with the Power of Truth, Justice, and Purpose. He's also a very well-respected two-time TEDx speaker, and as you can imagine, I am chomping at the bit to have lots of juicy conversations today with Ron. So welcome to the show. Let's get started. Jamie, great. Let's, let's do it. Yeah, let's, let's just dig right in. Let's get our so, shift together. Mm. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I actually am just compelled to start with talking about your most recent book, to be honest, um, because it's just so relevant right now with mm. everything that's happening in the world and in our country and with um you know, the, the, the push to equality of all people and, and, and mission-driven organizations. You know, it, it's the, the, the timing of your book, I'm sure, is no coincidence. And let's, let's unpack some of the lessons. Yeah. Well, first of all, Shani, thank, thank you for that. And I, my hoping is that the timing is, is every bit as relevant as we think it is. Um, it, it, it is time, isn't it, to have this, you know, we, the conversation we seem to have avoided for the last 20 years. Yep. Um, because our experience of honesty has fallen through the floor, our expectations, <laughs> right, you, you, have to look, you have to look too far, um, our expectations of it have gone through the roof. And so it's no longer enough for a leader to not be a liar or, or an overt jerk. Um, you have to now say the right thing, tell the truth, do the right thing, be just and fair, and say and do the right thing for the right reason, be purpose-driven. Mm -hmm. And honesty is defined now by all three. It's not just enough to do one of those. If you do one of them, you could be a nice person, be well-intended, be thoughtful, but you're not going to be labeled honest and, and mm -hmm. not reputationally for a long time. Um, I didn't want to write it. I wanted to know, you know, so you used the really wise words before our, in our pre-show about, you know, how many strategies really fail because the behavior being shaped by the organization actually discourages the very things you need to deliver the strategy. Well, yeah. I wanted to know under what conditions does that happen? Under what conditions will people say the right thing, tell the truth, like your strategy sucks? Um, mm -hmm. Will they do the right thing, behave fairly, and, and, and serve others versus serve their own interests yeah. first? And will they serve a greater purpose, serve the mission behind that strategy? And under what conditions will they lie, cheat, and be selfish? Um, and turns out we can predict. Turns out you know, we, we um, analyzed 15 years of data, uh, 3,200 interviews, use, wow. IBM, use IBM Watson to do some great algorithmic statistical modeling to be able to predict what are the situations in which uh, one will happen over the other. And we learned that there are four. There are four, well, there could be others, but we found four very relevant conditions in which organizations are creating the very behaviors uh, that undermine the very things they say they want. Okay. Mm. First, um, let's go right to the strategy issue, right? Uh, clarity in who you are, right? We all have on the wall a set of words about ourselves, our missions, our purpose statements, our values. Turns out it actually, they actually have to count, right? If, if, what um, the words and actions of your strategy match, meaning you are who you say you are. 
um, people's experience, your customers, your employees' experience of your statement of identity are consistent, you are three times more likely to have people tell the truth, behave fairly, and serve a purpose. Wow. If you have institutionalized duplicity, meaning we say this, but we do this, you know, we say collaboration, we say we value diversity, we say we're customer focused, but but the practices belie that. Now you're three. You tell people in our organization we say one thing and do another, and that's okay. So now you're three times more likely to have people lie, cheat, and be selfish. Yep. Second one was accountability. The way we honor each other's contributions, not the way we reward them, but the way I treat your work. If people feel like their contributions are measured with dignity, mm -hmm. meaning you honor them as part of who I am, and fairly, including the places where I suck. Um, if, I, if I feel that there's dignity and fairness in the way I'm held accountable, um, you're four times more likely to have people mm -hmm. lie to uh, 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 tell the truth, behave fairly, and serve a purpose. But if I feel like it's unfair, meaning I'm crammed into some category, I'm given a label, you know, I'm a two, um, you, you, you have no idea what it took for me to do my work. You, you set me up to fail. You've given me a job without the resources and authority. If I feel this unfairness in there, now I'm going to embellish my accomplishments, hide my mistakes, yep. um, and look out for my own, cover my own ass. Mm -hmm. Four times more likely to have that happen. Okay. Third with governance was transparency and governance, right? Meaning when I show up in the room for a meeting to make a decision, A, is the information in the room reliable? Do I trust it? Um, and do I trust that my voice is welcome to dissent or disagree with what's happening here? Mm -hmm. Or is what's happening in the room orchestrated theater? <laughs> yeah. Right? It's a performance. Your job is to make it look like I'm being involved in the decision you've already made. Um, and the information I, I get to evaluate that has to come from the hallway, the underground, my you know, my, the back channels. If it's what's happening in the room is, is transparent and safe, you're three and a half times more likely to have people tell the truth, behave fairly, and serve a purpose. But if it's, if it's all a ruse, now you're three and a half times more likely to have people lie, cheat, and be selfish. And the last one, which was probably, Shaney, our biggest surprise, border wars. If there is fragmentation in the organization, the classic silos that are, have unresolved issues, so the classic sales and marketing, yep. the operations and supply chain, um, R&D and marketing. Um, sales and service, it, yes. Sales and service, HR and everybody, right? <laughs> right? If those border wars are unresolved and there's a, a, a disconnection there and there's misaligned KPIs and there's rivalry, you are six times more likely to have people lie, cheat, and be selfish. Because now when you fragment the organization, you fragment the truth. So now we have dueling truths, which means it's not about the truth anymore, it's about my truth, right? Which means I'm right and you're wrong. We have we's and they's, we don't have a we. Right. Um, but if you have cohesion, if you if coalesce those seams and stitch them so that we're serving a greater good together, we're creating co-creating value here, now you're six times more likely to have people behave fairly, tell the truth, and serve a purpose. And here's the interesting thing about the statistical models, Shaney, they're cumulative. So if you do all four of those things well, reasonably well, now you're 16 times more likely to have people tell you the truth, even when it's hard, um, do the right thing, even when it's hard, and serve others first, and serve a purpose. But if you suck at all of them, you, now you're 16 times more likely to wind up on the front page headline of a story you never wanted to be in. Mm. Well, you know, as you're talking, this is going back a long time in my career, in, in my first job at Goldman Sachs, one of my the biggest client teams I worked on was Enron. And so as I'm hearing you speak about this, that's one of the many yep. companies that fell from grace for good reason that was yep. going through my mind. And I want to pause and ask leadership, Jersey, you know, you don't have to be a prominent Fortune 500 company for this to matter. You can have a small business or medium-sized privately Health company, or or even be a nonprofit, or a school, or a healthcare system. Like it doesn't matter. Any place where there's a collection of people trying to work together, this shit matters. And 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 boy, when I hear sixteen times is the cumulative effect of nailing all four of those things. Like who wouldn't listen up? I mean, I can't wait to get my hands on this book. And you know, you know, you and I are. In, in, in the same sandbox together, talking to leaders about these subjects and point for point, I, you know, I'm thinking of 
of executives and senior level leaders that I coach who come with some of these exact challenges and they feel helpless, you know, as if it's happening to them. And sometimes it is, but sometimes they can also do things. Well, sometimes, sometimes it's happening because they're, it's not happening to them, it's happening because of them. Well, uh, right. And they just don't want to accept that. Mm. Yeah, well, and, and so therein lies my, my follow-up question, which is when you do feel like you're actually one of the good guys or good gals who, who wants to abide by those things, but you're surrounded organizationally by other leaders who aren't walking the talk, so to speak, what's your advice? It's, you know, it's a great question, Shani. And you know what? You still have control over something. You can still be a hero. So every chat, every section of the book has a chapter for the system and a chapter for you as an individual. So we can oh, all do our part, right? So you're, you're not going to be left hanging around a, you know, I'm, I'm in a corrupt system. Now, if the, if the system's going down, get out, right? If, if, it's, if it's that toxified and it's in stage four, wish it well and move on. <laughs> if it's not, you know, you, you have a team, right? So next time in your team meeting, Pull the mission statement off the wall. Pull the values off the wall. Put it on the table and say, hey, how do, do we live these? Let's talk about how we're doing. If somebody, if somebody came in and videoed our team for a whole day, could they use that video to train people on that, on that material? Would they? What makes, when do you feel most proud? So that, you know, uh, accountability. Who on your team has ever used the words to you, that's not fair? <laughs> oh, everybody. Right. So pay attention. That's not fair. Is this is the stage that's set for an end run? It's a, that's a line of sight because the minute people feel wronged, they feel entitled to take. Yes. Yeah. And so the ethical fungus is growing in the petri dish. You know, Wells Fargo, Theranos, uh, Volkswagen, Enron. Right. The seeds for those failures were sown years before the infection came to light. Yeah. Years. So you have to assume the ethical fungus is growing in the cracks of your organization today. It's there. So don't assume because you can't see it or spell it. It's not there. Go find it, right? Who, if I said to you, if I asked your team members who the organizational bullies are, could they name them? Of course they could. You know who they are. Well, they don't report to me. So what? You know they're doing it. You know they're mistreating people. Yep. If I said to you, who does your organization privilege? Your tech company? I bet it's the engineers. You're a brand company, I'll bet it's the marketers. You're mm -hmm. a micro company, I'll bet the salespeople getting privileged. Well, those privileges yep. disadvantage others. Have you talked about that, right? Who, who, which identities, right? That's you white guys. You know, which identities are privileged? Which identities are, are underrepresented or disadvantaged? Whether you think they are or not, if in their own eyes they're disadvantaged, you have to ask them. It, can people in your organization say this is true? No matter who I show up as, you know, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, gay, straight, you know, intersectional, hidden disability, visible disability, no matter who yeah. I show up as, do I have the same chance of success as anybody else? And in most organizations, the answer is no. Well, and, and my point, Shane, is this. If you can't go yes immediately, if you have to go, hmm, the answer is no, then you have to ask yourself simply this. Somebody within your reach is in that no. Fix it. Go yes. fix it. Who's your they? Who, what, what cross-functional partner to your team, when you hear their name, makes you roll your eyes? You hear they're coming to the meeting and you, you have a stomachache. Yeah. You, you, you incrementally take their time on the agenda and shorten it to 10 minutes. Because that means you're their they, right? And when you, when you have a they, them, that means you have contempt. That means you have a border war. Right. And contempt is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And guess what? So, why, what, what, what who's, who's they can you, what, which they can you make a, a we? Yeah, if that relationship were better, if that relationship was stronger, well, first of all, what's your part of the crap, right? You, you know, it takes two to tango. So, what have you contributed to being your life miserable? Yep. Bring that team together with your team and say, let's be honest, this is not working. Let's yep. fix it. Let's fix this seam. You can't fix all the seams, but you can fix that one. So four very simple things any leader can do to dramatically raise the odds that people are going to show up every day and tell you the truth no matter what 
it takes, behave toward each other better than they, they treat themselves, and serve a purpose versus their own interests. Yep. Here's a simple litmus test. If you don't have somebody coming in your office at least twice a week, saying something that makes you uncomfortable to hear, you can be very confident your leadership sucks. That's so true. Very simple. So right. when's the last time somebody came in and said something that was hard, to you, hard for them to say and hard for you to hear, and hopefully you didn't crap on them, you, you took it well and you didn't bristle, right. and, and it changed the course of a decision or your behavior? Right. And, the, and I think one of the nuances there is it's not just a run-of-the-mill complaint. It's no, a it's not whining. Thing. It's, it's something, it's important. Yeah. It could be the product you're going to launch. It could be the labeling for your packaging. It could be anything that someone thinks is a bad idea or something you said that was offensive or a decision you made that somebody felt was unfair or a behavior you do that's chronic that they find insulting or mm -hmm. demeaning or someone on your team that's behaving that way. If, you, if you're assuming that no news is good news, you're just naive, right? You are, you are the topic of dinner conversations in your team's homes. That's right. If you don't know what stories they're telling about you, you should get in on the conversation. Absolutely. And I think the reality is most leaders are ill-equipped, lack confidence, and simply don't know how to do any of these things or to implement the types of um, you know, protocols on their teams and in their organizations that set the stage for that kind of psychological safety. People have never been trained to give constructive feedback. So it's delivered awkwardly or insufficiently or not at all, or, or passive aggressively. They don't know how to have- Those are all the good ones. <laughs> What's that? Or, belliger or belligerently. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so it's, and, and I don't know about, I'm sure this is the case for you too. Clients are saying like, like, can you come in and teach us that stuff? And it's like, well, yes, we, there are frameworks, there are best practices, there are great trainings that can reinforce. And it, it can't just be the flavor of the day and check the box and suddenly you think it's fixed. Like there has to be a real commitment right. to these behavioral changes. And adults don't like to change partially because they're stubborn par and partially because we're, you know, the habits we already have are hardwired into our brains. And so it takes more commitment than most leaders are willing to give right. for these changes to take place, which is one of the biggest frustrations to me in this line of work is like they, like my favorite cup call one time was, you know, we've got an employee engagement problem and, and, we, and, and you know, other related, related tangential things. Can, can, you, can you give a keynote at our conference and fix that? <laughs> oh, that's funny, you know? I, here, I'm going to refer you to a magician. Yeah, exactly. Car. Yeah. He, yeah. Has, he has kids' birthday parties and he does corporate events. You'll love him. Mm. Yeah, right. Exactly. It'll create engagement for exactly 15 minutes. <laughs> right. Um, right. Yeah, mm. it's, it's, it's so true. So, you know, one of the things I said to you again pre-show was I, I love your rich, colorful language because um, well, in full transparency, because it reminds me of me. Like, I don't like to say things in a boring, <laughs> you know, sort of, uh, you know, like vanilla way. I like to say things in a provocative, interesting, or a, to use Seth Godin's word, remarkable way. It's worth remarking about as opposed to same old, same old shit. So another place where, you know, as, as I was studying up on you before the podcast, I found some very, very provocative and funny things. Although ethical fungus right now is still at num is still is number one for me right now. I freaking love that. Um, you you um, you've written an article and and knowing you, I'm sure it's based on on research um, of, about how to lead a high performing team. And there are eight principles. Um, is there a couple of are there a couple of them that you feel particularly strongly about, and if not, I'll I'll pick a couple to ask you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm trying to remember, remember the article. <laughs> that would be the first miracle to remember it. Um, if I remember correctly, one of the one of them in there, I think I wrote about the fact that first of all, just make sure it's a team. Yes, that was number one, which I thought was brilliant because right, just because you're a bunch of people does not mean you're a team, right? And and oh, just because you share the same boss doesn't mean you're a team. It doesn't even mean you should be a team. And so. 
uh, or because you always have the same staff meeting. So first of all, you have to make sure that, that there's actually a reason to team, that there's actually yeah. interdependent work that you rely on each other for. So that's the first thing is, you know, now if you all are not a team and you, and you can't stand each other, that's a problem. We can fix the relationships, but not in the service of interdependent work, in the service of, so it's not a crappy place to work. Yeah. Um, but, but most leaders think, well, they all report to me, so that's my team. Um, but really, it's just a hub and spoke set of relationship where you're the hub and all paths lead, all, all paths lead to you. Um, so um, the other one I think is, um, one of them was, uh, I think you mentioned earlier, pull the weeds. Yes, uh, I love So many weeds. leaders are so uh, reticent to fire people. Um, now, it's, it's a big decision. It's not, you shouldn't take it lightly. But, and, and it's even harder if you hire them right? Because now it's a reflection of your decision making. But the reality is allowing someone who's not performing in a role effectively to stay in that role because you want to give them a chance is not kind at all. It's actually cruel. Totally. It's cruel because they're twisting in the wind. Everybody knows it. Everybody's backing away or they're resenting the fact that you're allowing them to underperform while they have to pick up the slack. So it's if you're like not you willing... Are a fly on the wall in a coaching conversation I just had with a client early, uh, well, on Friday, where, you know, he was updating me on some of the moves they made on the leadership team, one of which was to let go someone he's known for 25 years. And, and he said, I was the number one advocate of that, even though I have the pre-existing relationship because the person wasn't performing. So yep. yeah, those, those decisions can be hard. And what's harder is the the repercussions of not doing it and, and those are worse they're actually yeah. worse you may think it's self-soothing because you're kicking the can down the road you the invoice is coming and it's there's compounded interest on that invoice mm. absolutely absolutely um you know another one that i wanted to ask you about which isn't necessarily um irreverent but also speaks to a place that i'm very passionate about which is the, the word love in, in the workplace and, and extracting it from what most people think of when they think of love as romantic love and saying, yeah. no, love is respect and humanity and dignity and empathy and, you know, seeing people as, as fellow humans. And so one of your recommendations is find ways to say, I love you. Tell yeah. me about that one. You know, I think your boss, first of all, many, many, many of us as bosses are, are doing a lot of reparenting, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I left, I, I, I did my, in my grad school, I did clinical psych for a year and then I switched over to org psych because I didn't want to deal with people's individual crap. And then I found out they all bring that crap to work anyway. So I did, now I just get it in mass. Um, yeah. But the reality is, you know, the place where you spend um, two thirds of your life um, it should never be a place devoid of love. Um, I need to know that I matter. I need to know that my work matters. I need to know that I matter to you. You're, you're someone in authority over me. If I'm, if you're indifferent toward me, how, how, how does, you know, one of the, one of the, so the, to, the book, to be honest, we have a lot of, we did a lot of uh, neuroscience work. I wanted to understand how our brains are wired for honesty and how our brains are wired for dignity. Well, it turns out our brains are wired to be dignified. Right. Okay. Our brains are wired to lean on what others think of us, especially those in authority. So you are holding the self concept of someone else's in their hands. You're holding their story in your hands. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know their story, if you're ambivalent toward their story or if you mistreat their story, you're just fostering poor performance and mediocrity. But you're fostering somebody whose sense of themselves is painful or, or, or maligned. And that's cruel. Yeah. Um, so you, you are in the unique position to unleash, to invite them to unleash the best version of themselves. Right. And knowing, knowing that they, you care, knowing that they matter to you, knowing that their experience of you matters to you is critical and that those are forms of love. Absolutely. And what do you say to the people, I'm sure you've run into them just like I have, who say, well, you know, I don't need to be friends with people at work and I keep my personal and my professional life separate. And, you know, I don't want people asking me about my personal life, so I'm not going to ask them about theirs. And, you know, that sort of talk track. I'm like, well, how's that working for you? <laughs> you right? When you go home at night, how many bottles of wine do you drink? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very lonely and, and wounded person. I, I think what I would, what, what I have said to somebody 
uh, in the past when I got that that sort of put up the wall speech, I said, I just said, I don't know who it was that hurt you so badly in your life that made you so unable to trust others, but I'm so sorry for that. Mm. Right. And that's where it does become therapy or, you know. <laughs> well, I, they don't, they, if, they, if, they, if that, they've got obviously a, a fortress built around their soul and that didn't get there randomly, right? Somebody helped put that there and, that, and that's sad. It is really sad. And, and, and that, that is their choice. choice. That, it, that, that is their choice, right? That they, they are allowed to not, they are allowed to have very big boundaries in their life. Yeah. Um, but they're also not allowed to say, people ignore me. No one talks to me. Um, yeah. Or no one, you know, I don't get respect, right? Because that choice to self, that's a, that's a deep commitment to self-protection, which again, you have that choice, but that choice comes with consequences, right? And so the, the deep loneliness you suffer, the deep sense of isolation. When you go home at night into the privacy of your own home and you're, you cry yourself to sleep um, and you ache, you know, you, just watching a TV commercial of people having fun makes you cry or makes you drink more or, you know, or, you know, gamble or drugs or, you know, por pornography, whatever your addiction is, you know, the, that's not random either. Right. Because whatever that void is that you're trying to protect is just a festering wound that's just going to get worse. And at some point, uh, you won't like how that's how that part of the story goes. Right. So, well, you know, to yeah, go but you give people your... the grace. You give people the grace to say, but you're allowed to have that that choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, to go back to something you said earlier, which is you know sometimes leadership is reparent reparenting. Like, so what is the obligation of a leader when they see someone who has that fortress around their heart, around their soul, to to get them help, even if they claim to not want it. At what point do you just have to let it be? Well, I, you, so what, what you, your goal is to not, as a leader, is not to urge them to change. What your goal is to say is, here's what I see. Okay. Right, is to simply say, hey, I just want you to know that I, I see th that you, you I, I wonder if you think it's safe here for you. I wonder if you feel like you can be yourself here. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you you have to be any more than who you are. You, you have a set of commitments to do this job, you have to deliver those. But just know that others see it, and others and I um, s would like to get to know you better. Would would like you to feel more welcomed here. Um, and I just want you to know that that if there's more we can do, we'd like to do that. But just know that your distance um, is it, not just relevant to you. It does matter to us. I'm not saying you mean to hurt people or that you mean to be cold or inhospitable. But just know others others our experience of you makes us feel awkward and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. and, you need to you need to be aware of that. You know, that's your advantage because um, it does affect how you work with people. So um, I'm not asking you to be anybody's best friend. I'm not asking you to be socialized. I'm not asking you to do anything that makes you feel less safe or comfortable. I'm just simply saying I need you to know that we see and we experience the consequences of that choice. Right. And that's that's your admit as a leader. I, I really love that advice because what it speaks to is belonging, which has been a theme that just comes up everywhere for me right now, both personally, professionally. And of course, once your senses are heightened to something, then you see it everywhere. Yep. Um, and belonging is just something. And, and maybe it's all the DE and I that, you know, belonging is sort of an umbrella term because it's, you know, it's not just, you know, race, sexual preference, nationality, right? I mean, there's so much to sure. belonging that transcends any of those and, if, and I mean, it's a, and there's actually a, a whole chapter, in, to be honest, about how do you create a sense of belonging to create your way, right? Um, how, do you, okay, how, do you create a, how do you create a welcoming presence for others? Um, and somebody that you're describing, Shaney, is somebody who clearly feels they don't belong. Right. And has probably been told that all their life and probably was a loner in junior high school, got beat up a lot, was bullied, um, probably suffered a severe death or loss in their, in their life, right? Yeah. Intimacy or connection to others is clearly not safe. And it, you're not, you may never penetrate that fortress, um, but you can do little things. You know, you can get them to participate in, say, I mean, sometimes when you sort of, you can sidetrack or trick their mind to say, hey, would you mind leading the next, you know, office luncheon? Would you mind posting that? You know, give them a, give them a special position of prominence right. where, they have to sh where they have to shine in spite of their own fear, in spite of their own contempt. Um, and, that, and let them feel the regard of others, let them feel the warmth Mm -hmm. because that, that's what'll melt that ice, right? Um, and you have to be willing to stick with it because it won't happen in one time. 
Um, and some of their own hard edges have probably alienated people, right? So it's a self-reinforcing narrative. If my narrative in my head says, I don't belong, I'm going to behave in ways that reinforce that truth. Absolutely. And I'm going to behave in ways that make people shun me so I can reinforce the notion that I don't belong. And, and so you have to be willing to sort of disconfirm that narrative and disrupt that script mm -hmm. by showing them that they actually do belong and that you're willing to show them grace despite their immaturity or their coldness or their aloofness. Okay. So what are some other recommendations you have for creating belonging besides giving people just some small tasks to keep them to start to melt ice? So uh, ask them, you know, ask, you don't have to sort of solve the problem and crack the code in your head. Simply say, when do you, when are you at your most safe? When do you feel at your best? Um, what, what, what is the sense of belonging you want? Look at it and make sure you're giving people belonging cues, right? The whole, just nod when they're talking. Mm -hmm. And say that's you know affirm their ideas. Here, here's one of the simplest ones. Um, the, the most powerful device is if you want to show somebody they matter, ask for the story. Mm -hmm. It's a simple device. When someone does a piece of work for you, you know they hand in a project, especially if it was a sacrifice or a hard, it was hard. Say, wow, I bet I have no idea what it took to accomplish that. Tell me how you did it. Right. Just listen to the story. Watch how they light up. Watch how they animate when they talk about what they struggled, where they broke through, what they learned. Take notes, ask questions, just let them tell the story and be fascinated by their story. Nothing creates a sense of belonging and, and appreciation more than welcoming somebody's story of a piece of work you don't have any idea what it took to do. You don't know how they fretted at night at home or stayed up to two in the morning getting that done for you or what it took. Um, and so when you say thank you, you probably don't even know. I mean, one of the questions I love to ask audiences when I speak is, how many of you have ever received a compliment from your boss that actually offended you? <laughs> Lots of hands go up. And I right. say, well, why were you offended? Clearly, they meant, they meant well. They didn't know, know what they were talking about. They, they, it was clearly obligatory. Um, they don't know what it took for me to actually accomplish that. There's reasons for it, right? So instead of giving your habitual, hey, thanks so much, appreciate that, or sending a text or something, or an email or saying an email and copying your boss so it looks like you're you know, whatever right just sit and ask for the story and let them tell the story let them tell in front of the whole team if you can and be fascinated be, be be in awe and honor of what they're handing you it's 15 minutes right but it can be it can change the game for somebody's sense of who they are in on your team absolutely and how they feel uh appreciated as an individual right yep. And, so, and thus that, that they belong. Mm. Yeah. So let, let me ask you for your story. What was it that got you into this space of leadership development and effective teamwork and so forth? Uh, gosh, it goes, it's a long, long way back, Shaney. But um, I began my career in the arts. I began my career in a very different field. Um, and I, got, I found out that I bored easily. You know, uh, <laughs> I have to do the same thing eight times a week for how long? Uh, and so I left, I left New York. Um, I, went on, I went to work for a, a nonprofit company um, that used media and all kinds of um, art forms to teach. And I was working in Europe, uh, we had, and the company had contracts with the U.S. military and state department. Okay. And we were doing a, a, a program uh, in the chapel at Dachau. So it was, no, nobody was, the symbolism wasn't lost. Here's this sacred room uh, in a horrible place. And, you know, this is going back quite a way. So the words diversity and inclusion weren't words then but that's probably what this workshop would have been called sure and we had germans and, and, and how America. not to be a genocidal maniac you know <laughs> <laughs> the four secrets of uh um <laughs> so there were germans and americans and civilians and military and government officials it was a room full of very different people and during one of the group conversations i, I was processing a soldier not much older than me at the time stood up and said i'm just so tired of being trained to hate and I remember being really flabbergasted. My first thought was, how, I don't understand how something we did up here made him think that. But then the, that he would get up in front of a whole room and say it. And so we processed it as a group. As a, but I wanted to know more. So mm -hmm. afterwards, you know, we're in Munich, so it's Oktoberfest, let's go out for beer. So we went out and I, I just wanted to understand, you know, how he came to that conclusion and what, what he was thinking about. Uh, and he, we talked about his you know, pride in serving his country and why he signed up to be in the military and what being trained to hate meant to him. And I was just fascinated by it. And I think that was the beginning of the arc in my career, Shane, where I realized, you know, telling great stories is interesting, but engaging people in their story, like I'll never get bored doing that. 
Uh, and I think that was the shift I began to make. Uh, I used your word. Um, to, toward uh, career and org behavior and leadership. Um, and came back to the States and, you know, changed companies and started my path there. And is that the point at which you went and got the, the master's degree in yep. organization? Okay. Got it. Yep. Well, that is a really cool story. And I guess it, in a perverse way, it's kind of neat that something positive came out of any land uh, on the premises of Dachau, having been there uh, myself. Well, I think I think one of the things I, I, I gosh, couldn't our country take such a good lesson from them? Um, you can't go anywhere in that country without seeing the commemoration of what they've done. Um, and they're, 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 you know, those, those signs outside those camps and outside those memorials that say never again, they meant, they mean it. I mean, you, you know, if you go to Berlin, especially you really are going to right. And, and yet you look at the atrocities in our, in our history and we struggle to own them. We struggle to honor them. You know, we haven't, we haven't done justice to, um, and we're paying a price now. We're paying a big price now because, you know, you, you can't let that cancer linger in your in your body for 400 years. At some point, there'll be a reckoning. And right. I, hope, I hope we're going to, I hope we will this, in this season now. I hope we will. Mm. Yeah, you know, and, and I'm going to ask a question that might be putting you on the spot. And if so, you can defer. Um, if you had President Biden in a room right now, what advice would you give him? given the state of our country. Who you say you are. Do what you say you were going to do. You said you wanted to be all of our presidents. The 74 million people who didn't vote for you start there because they're not, they're not all psychopathic maniacs. They're That's good right. people with, they're with smart ideals. They care about this country deeply and they're scared of you. Um, they, they, they feel like they've been left behind, in many cases left behind. They feel like they have been forgotten. They feel like they're not cared about. They feel like their their futures are not the dreams they wanted, um, and then they're not they're not sure you care about them. So go and talk to them. Start with them. If you do that, I'll believe you are who you say you are. Interesting. Great. Love that. You are quick on your feet. I've I guess... thought about that question a lot. Oh, you have. <laughs> oh my gosh. Sure. Before I voted for him. <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh my God. Okay, and so I also one one of your TED Talk titles is is very um, interesting to me. How to be more powerful than powerless. So what's you know I guess TED Talks in and of themselves are already succinct. What's the succinct version of the TED Talk? <laughs> in a in a nutshell. Um, um, so for our last book, Rising to Power, um, based on a 10-year study uh, of leaders wanting to understand why has it been okay for you know, the last 30 years that more than half of leaders who ascend to bigger roles fail in their first 18 months. We've known that, right? Well, why is that okay? I get why the recruiters like it because it's an annuity for them. But w why do we just accept that as, a, as normal? Right. And it was personal. It started because somebody in an organization we had done work with rose up and failed. And the CEO called like more than suddenly inferred that it was our, partly our fault for not preparing them. And I was like, I don't ever want that call again. So we went in and investigated what happened. And that led to our 10 year study. So one of the things we isolated for in the research was power, right? Okay. Assuming that what we would find is the corruption of it. We would find the use of self-interest, the use of self-indulgence for immoral gain, for all the crap we all don't want hate to read about. Mm -hmm. That was certainly there, but it was by far not the greatest abuse of power. The actual, by a significant factor, the greatest abuse of power we found was the abandonment of it. Mm. People too afraid to use it. People setting it down because they didn't want to use it. Um, and, and, and incurring favor and buying popularity and being nice and saying yes too much um, because they lacked the sense of leadership and the sense, and because they were so afraid of being seen as a power monger that they didn't use the power at all. Um, and leaders are understanding power comes with your position. We have more sources of power than just formal authority. We have informational power. We have relational power. We have um, uh, you know, positional power. And, and all of those combine together for you to do extraordinary things. And it's expected of you, right? You can write organizational injustices. You can help people become the best version of themselves. You can use the information you have to change minds.
You can use your position to help people grow and stretch. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we have to see that spinelessness, that inability to use power as every bit as abusive of power as the Harvey Weinsteins of the world. It's, it's just as destructive, it's more insidiously destructive. We just, we just sort of write it off differently. But if you have power with your role, you have to steward it well. Right. Leadership, like leadership, is the ability to, leadership is the ability to disappoint people at a rate they can absorb. And you have to be willing to say no and say the hard things for the greater good. And sometimes that means using your power well. People will respect you. Your goal, if your goal is to be liked and highly regarded and popular and not estranged from people, you shouldn't be leading anybody. That's mm -hmm. right. Well, what's, what's the famous quote? If you try to please everyone, you'll please no one. And, Quickly. and I think that's the trap a lot of leaders fall into is they, sure. they do, they want to be liked and, res and they confuse being liked with being respected. And they, want, they just want to be, they're all benevolent, benevolent Santa Clauses. Mm. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Well, any other words of wisdom for the leadership viewers and listeners before we wrap it up? You know what? Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Keep shifting. Get your shift together. Uh, and recognize that if, if you have people in your charge, you have an incredible opportunity to change the world. Not the whole world, but your world. Mm. Absolutely. And thank you for saying that because it's it's a message that I try and reinforce all the time with my clients and you know, anybody who will listen to me, which is, you know, stop thinking about what's out of your control and start thinking about what you can influence and what are ways to succeed in spite of something or around something or through something or beneath yeah. something. <laughs> As opposed to, you know, essentially, if, if you don't do that, then you're just a victim. Yep. So it's about responsibility, personal responsibility and taking ownership and, and all those good things. So thank you so much for being on the show today. This was such an interesting conversation, lots of highlights. If people want to reach you and or buy any of your books, including getting on the waiting list for your new book, what's the best way to find you? So uh, a couple places, come to our website, Navalent, N-A-V-A-L-E-N-T.com. We've got lots of great videos and free, some free eBooks uh, to sort of help your own leadership journey. We've got some great video series. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn and follow me on Twitter. Please do that. Uh, and lastly, tobehonest.net. Um, you can find, there's a, whole, there's, a, there's a video series about the book. You can watch the videos uh, on the book's research. And then Amazon.com and click Add to Cart. Mm. Love it. Ah, to be honest.net. Okay, so this is it, it. It could take on a life of its own. So well, it's like, interesting. Listen, listen during the day. Listen for how many times people say about that, that, that title of that book, right? Which, to be honest, I mean, pe people right, are like, saying, no, "Don't be honest with me. Lie to me." Yeah. <laughs> well, Isn't I it funny that. how many qualifiers we have for the truth? You know, let me be frank. Well, to be to be honest, let me be blunt. Well, let me be well, transparent. Uh, Quite frankly, I'm being transparent. On my mother's grave. I mean, I've got my keynotes open up with like 30 of all the qualifiers, right? What, 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 what was it before? <laughs> totally. All right. Well, leadership, there's lots of good food for thought today. And I hope you took as many notes as I did. So the gist of it, though, is are you saying the right thing, doing the right thing, and for the right reasons? And even if you are, are your colleagues, are the people who work for you, are you know the folks at the top of your organization who you may feel you have zero influence with, are they doing those things? And that's, it's, I mean, of all the things we talked about today, they almost all kind of come back to that, don't they? Would, would that we all would take them more seriously. Mm. Yeah, so thank you for being on the show. Leader shifters, you know how to reach me, all the various and sundry social media, except TikTok. Not sure I'm ever going to make it onto that one. Uh, <laughs> that's a generation gap I can live with. Uh, <laughs> and uh, of course, Shaney oh. at theleadershiftproject.com. This was so much fun, Ron. We'll let you know when it's up and airing. And leader shifters, until next time. Thank you. Shaney, a pleasure. Take good care. Mm -hmm.